All right, welcome everyone to this webinar on anticipatory humanitarian action organized by the Resident Coordinator Office at the UAE in partnership with the World Food Programme, ICRC, OCHA, and UNDIR, UNIDIR. And also we have a special guest from the UAE COP28 Climate uh, uh, Change Presidency. I would like to start by thanking you all for taking part in this webinar and giving the floor for our colleague Helena de Jong, who is the Senior uh, Partnership Specialist at the UAE COP28 Climate Envoy for opening remarks. Helena, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Redan, and good afternoon or maybe good morning to some of you still. Uh, as Redan said, I'm Helena de Jong. I'm a Senior Specialist in the COP28 partnerships team where I cover humanitarian and fragility related outcomes in the non-negotiated space. I am delighted to be here as anticipatory action is one of the areas that we are looking at with great interest. So let me dive straight in. Uh, I understood that we have a lot of ground to cover um, as you can also tell from the agenda and give you some insights on how we approach anticipatory action within the, the COP space. So most of you will already know that COP28 will be hosted by the UAE from 13 November to 12 December this year in, in Expo City in Dubai. And you may have also heard that people refer to this as a milestone moment. This is really because the world will assess progress to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement with the first global stock take. And you can look at the global stock take as, a, as kind of a scorecard of uh, where we are at and how we are doing with the implementation. Well, I probably don't need to tell you that we do not need the stock take to know that we are off track. And uh, we therefore feel strongly that we should not use this as a moment in time to just point out that we are off gap, uh, off track and that and a moment to to point out the gaps. So we are therefore taking a more forward looking approach with a focus on the solutions and the ideas that we can feed into uh, and that we can feed into a plan of action to really change the trajectory that we are currently on. So this of course includes scaling efforts on mitigation delivering on the global goal on adaptation, on the operationalization of loss and damage funding arrangements uh, for the most climate vulnerable communities, and on unlocking larger flows of finance. But it also includes looking at elevating solutions in the food, uh, on, in the food space, on water, on nature, on education, and in the humanitarian space. So these are the solutions that are uh, intended to complement the formal negotiations of the COP process. So how do we go about this? If we take a look at the humanitarian space, we know that humanitarian needs are higher than ever. And we also know that an increasing number of countries is facing protracted crises and crises where climate impacts such as drought and flooding blend with other factors such as socioeconomic instability, displacement, inequality, and therefore these uh, kind of blend, blending of factors can also exacerbate existing risks, including to uh, security, and this can lead to a vicious cycle. We also know that the humanitarian system is underfunded and under immense pressure, therefore. So the question we are asking ourselves um, as the COP28 presidency team is how can COP28 be the starting point of change? So if we look at some sort of transformation in the humanitarian space, what would that look like? What are the promising initiatives and pilots that uh, have already been undertaken? And how can, for example, anticipatory action pilots be scaled up what is the role of forecast based financing and how do insurance products fit in? But also how can the coverage of early warning systems be expanded and how can these early warnings uh, be connected to early action and financing? So we know there are a lot of actors that are working on this already and I know several of you are, uh, are online and we, we will hear from you um, later during the presentations. Um, that we will work together uh, uh, on this. And we also work very closely together with Egypt, who had the COP27 presidency, 
and a wide group of, uh, of other stakeholders to identify what needs to happen and how we can achieve that. So we also know that the countries listed as the most vulnerable to climate impacts uh, are often amongst the countries that are also affected by conflict and fragility. But if we look at the climate finance flows, we see that these flows hardly reach communities in places that are also experiencing conflict and fragility. So another priority for us is to bridge this gap in climate finance flows to fragile areas. And a couple of questions in this respect that we ask our, ourselves is what are the main challenging uh, challenges both on the end of, uh, of climate finance providers, uh, but also on the end of countries and communities on the receiving end. What actions do we need to undertake to enhance finance access, uh, finance access to uh, conflict affected contexts? And how can such finance still flow and be implemented in areas that are considered to be riskier by um, some of the development banks? So how can we mitigate risks and how can the private sector, for example, be brought in and what is the role of humanitarian uh, actors and organizations? Um, so as you can probably tell uh, already, we are seeking to involve a wide range of, of actors, the private sector, scientists, civil society, women and youth. And several of these groups are traditionally not very present at COP. So, to enable their participation, including of humanitarian actors and uh, actors that are more on the peace and security side of the house, and to ensure that they have a docking point in the COP28 uh, process, we are building in dedicated moments and spaces at the COP um, in, on, around these specific thematic areas, so including on fragility, but also, for example, on, on health. And uh, we also want a very inclusive process. And we know it's not very easy for someone, for some of these stakeholders, um, such as youth, to just buy a ticket and fly to Dubai to participate in a COP. So I just um, want to highlight one of the initiatives that we are undertaking um, to enhance the inclusion of certain groups, um, which is that we are launching an international youth climate delegate program today which is really uh, focused on bringing in the voices, perspectives and priorities of young people globally in the COP uh, process. And we will support uh, 100 youth delegates with funding and capacity building to fully participate at um, uh, COP28 with a priority uh, for youth from countries and communities that are most affected by climate change, such as small island states and these developed countries. So in short, and I'll, I'll stop there, um, we are looking at a cup of action and a cup that will accelerate this action across the board and across sectors. And I really look forward to hearing from, uh, from the speakers on anticipatory action, and I very much look forward to hearing your ideas and insights. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Helena, for your remarks. It is a complex topic and uh, covers m multiple issues. I would like to give the floor now to our colleague Jesse Mason from the World Food Programme for the lead presentation. Jesse, you have the floor. Great, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, I thanks everyone for, for taking the time to, to join us today. I think, you know, as, as Helena said, um, it's, a tall, it's a tall order, right? And I think it requires the the work from us all to to collectively address this problem in, in, in many in many many ways and so today i wanted to try and give um yeah just a little bit of an overview of how how wfp is looking at this and of course i i speak on behalf of my partners such as ocha and fao and uh, start network um and ifrc who are collaborating with us um in making sure that this work that we're doing is is inclusive and and has the largest impacts and and leverage so let me just show you my screen and today I'm presenting from from uh, DACA and uh, let me put this to full screen, which means I'll lose my my notes. Here we go. So I wanted to frame frame some of the work we're doing at WFP and, and a lot of the work we're doing on anticipatory actions around around some of the solutions to to loss and damages, right? Some of the solutions to to mitigating the the impacts um, on the people who we on the people who we serve, and and looking at some of the different ways in 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 which we can do that, and and one of the ways or or several of the ways that WFP has been has been looking at has been across these three 
these sort of three thematic area, thematic areas where we anticipate help communities to to anticipate climate hazards before losses and damages occur. So making sure that we're able to provide the resources, the early warning information and the types of support. And I say we I, I want to speak on behalf of our of our partners um, because I know this is this is a, a collective approach and obviously a, a massive problem. And then ensure that we protect the most food and security your people on the front lines of the climate crisis, you know, often who, who lack the financial safety nets needed to act on those early warnings and to be able to make sure they're able to get out of harm's way. And I think this is easy for us to imagine um, in our own lives. You know, we, we may know that there is a shock coming or we may know that there is something uh, on the horizon, but if we're not able to to act on those pieces, if we're not able to purchase purchase items that allow us to protect our homes or our, our livelihoods, um, or our lives, then then oftentimes those early warnings can can fall on fall on deaf ears. But at the same time, understanding the importance of of early warnings, empowering people to make those decisions, uh, even knowing where we are today as we're starting to see to see the numbers of food insecure people climb, um, we still need to make sure people are empowered with the knowledge of of what's coming what's coming ahead. And of course, as we've all discussed many many times, this is not a silver bullet. This needs to be implemented alongside our partners who are aiming to to restore degraded ecosystems which provide natural protections against loss and damages and we need to make sure as humanitarians that we're able to partner with these with with these colleagues in order to make sure that as we are supporting in the immediate term with respect to natural hazards or in respect to to a climate shock that this type of work can continue on, that this type of restoration work is not then degraded as, as those around, um, you know, descend on, on these lands that have been, that are now restored and, 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 and have massive impacts by cutting down trees or, or moving soil or homes, et cetera, and, and sending us back many, many years. And so this is part of a, a collective effort on, on all of us. So what I wanted to talk a little bit today, and we had described was, was what is anticipatory action? You know, what is what is this this new piece? And and I said it's not a silver bullet because I think sometimes when new things come along, people think, oh, well, maybe this will solve all my problems. Uh, maybe this will solve everything. And and unfortunately, in life, it, it never really works that way, right? It's it's about combining best practices. It's about combining the different tools that are contextualized to the places where we work, and and making sure that that these pieces work part and parcel and, and 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 while we may be able to mitigate the impacts of a short term emergency or a short term climate hazard, we need to make sure that those efforts around restoring degraded lands and making sure people are continuing to having the resources needed in order to build that community resilience uh, continues uh, hand in hand. And a lot of this work and and in, in, in one of the great things about anticipatory action is this hasn't been hard for people to to wrap their minds around it because it's so logical. I mean, every country in the world has a meteorological agency who is tasked with providing a, a an early warning or or at least an understanding of the future climate so that people can make decisions. Those decisions have costs. But not acting also has costs, so being able to have that type of information hand uh, in our hands means that we can make those those efforts jointly. We can make those efforts collect, make those choices collectively. And so that means making sure that the capacity strengthening of early warning systems is directly in need with what we need to see happen at the household level. So oftentimes when we think about, oh, well, we need a better early warning system, that comes that sometimes comes to the end of the conversation. But when we start about talking about working with FIO and OCHA and WFP, we can say exactly what we need to happen at the household level. We need to be able to make sure that people who are able to access early warnings or cash or other types of inputs have enough time to utilize them, have enough time to access them, have enough time to utilize them and have enough time to get out of harm's way. And it's that time and it's that is that is the type of capacity we need built in early warning systems and that skillfulness, that trust in early warning systems is what allows us to make those activities. So why anticipatory action? Well, I think Helena covered it covered it pretty well, and I think we can just rehash it here. I mean, climate change is is a main driver of food insecurity and complex emergencies. We know that conflict and economic shocks are starting to intertwine with with climate change and making it more and more difficult for us to get ahead of the curve, right? And 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 oftentimes we may hear, 
well, let's worry about what's going to happen in the future after we take care of what's happening today. And unfortunately, again, as I said earlier, that's just not how life works. We need to be able to save lives now, but at the same time, be able to change lives into the future. We need to do them hand in hand. And so as we see shocks increasing due to climate change, we need to be able to get ahead of those curves. We need to be able to shift from always reacting to start to have a more forward looking humanitarian system. And that means that means changing the mindset a little bit about what we and how we work with our partners and what it is we want to do. That means while the World Food Program being one of the largest humanitarian agencies, it also needs to build capacity in itself in order to understand how can we leverage these tools that are working in some of the farthest corners of the world to be able to get ahead of these curves. And how do we do this in partnership with governments? Obviously, when it comes to acting before a hazard has occurred, we no longer have that call to action, right? It hasn't happened yet. So collectively with governments and partners, we need to be able to be on the same page of what an early warning is. What do we want to see that early warning do? And when does it need to happen in order to make sure we have the impacts or changes in people's lives we hope to see? To make sure we break that cyclical nature of people having been constantly falling in or additional people falling into needing support from, from social protection or humanitarian systems. Oftentimes, such as the people who may be on the edge, may be able to make choices themselves based on that early warning in order to, to avoid falling into that trap, in order to protect their, their livelihoods. And I wanted to send, spend a moment, and I think some of my colleagues on the call will, will, will come in on this a little bit as well. It also means working on anticipatory action in fragile context. It's a, it's a place where we don't often talk about it, and there's been a reason why. I think as we started to, to develop this, this, this new way of working, or, or maybe not new way of working, but implementing the way we always work into our humanitarian setting, we weren't able to understand exactly how this happens in fragile context because the needs now were just so high. But at the same time, we're seeing uh, um, that the amount of money from climate finance is being mainly directed to, to places that are that are not in conflict. And I can't remember the number now, but I think it's UNDP put a number out there. It's around $2 of climate finance to fragile uh, contacts versus around $16 in, in, in developing countries that, that are without these types of, of types of conflict. And I think I think it's it's really important for us to be able to start to look to that future in these places and it requires it requires a different way of working it requires maybe building up the capacities and our partners um, to act as that crutch um, as we start to battle with making sure people are both being protected uh, and anticipate climate hazards that are coming whilst in a very difficult a difficult situation and that needs to be a collective effort on how we on how we start to make sure that these conflicts and, and climate shocks um, don't you know, start to impact uh, each other in a way. And we have the double dividend of, of, of impact when we start to reduce the impacts of climate shocks. We start to reduce that need for people to, to move to new areas or to move to lands that have been restored. And we start to reduce um, the conflict itself and the, and the need for, for migrations. So, I can say, you know, quite a bit of nice words from that, but I want I wanted to just sort of look at sort of the, the components to this. And, and the reason why I showed this slide was was because. These problems can be so complex that it can sometimes feel overwhelming. I mean, you, you've probably all had conversations with with partners and colleagues and friends and you know, the war and everything that's happening. It, it can be just incredibly overwhelming to the point where where you don't know where to start. And one of the things that our partners uh, on the call have have sat down and, and worked on is 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 putting this into bite sized pieces, putting this into problems that that individual agencies and, and collective or, or individual um, offices within our own agencies can use their expertise to, to support. So making sure, for instance, our triggers, you know, when do we see anticipatory action or when are we going to act? Um, are, are developed in concert with our with the national authorities or where those national authorities are not yet strong enough to do. We support them in, in making sure that knowledge is is available and that can be done obviously very, very well with our development partners. It means being able, as I said earlier, being able to define what do we actually mean by developing triggers you know, for who, 
uh, and when and 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 WFP and FAO and, and, and others can can provide that information. We'll, we have that information at the household level. We also know that we need to be able to define what it is we want to do. You know, many, many years ago when we first started this and, and some of you may have heard this term before was we had a word that was or, or a name called forecast based financing. And we chose that word because we were so worried that if we focus solely on the early warning system part, the forecasting part, everyone would forget about the financing, the part that says, how are we going to empower people to do something about it? How are we going to make sure that people don't get an early warning and then say, great, you want me to evacuate or great, you would like me to protect my assets or you would like me to change some of my agricultural practices, but I have no resources, no resources to do that. And so we wanted to make sure that 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 financing had come out very, very clear. Over time, we realized that some people, some understandings with that, what we really meant was we just wanted to preposition financing. We would just say, well, actually, there's a lot of money available should you need it. The issue came down when we started to define anticipatory actions as people needed time. People needed time to define what was good, what was contextual, what was important, what was what was right in this country or this community, who was going to do that, et cetera. And that took time. And under the under the umbrella of an emergency, you just didn't you just didn't have that. So we wanted to be able to sit down and you know a well ahead of the monsoon or well ahead of the hurricane season and start to define these these activities. It was quite interesting when when we first started, and people would say to me, "What was called FBF?" They would say. But where's the second F? Where's all the financing? And I would always say, well, what would you like to do? Well, we'll give food. I said, no, no, no. The drought hasn't happened or the flood hasn't happened. What would you like to do? And it took some time to think about that. Right? It took a lot of time. And I think you'll probably hear from Julia a little bit about, about some of the things that we've done together, um, you know, collectively as organizations to define exactly how do we combine our, our collective expertise our collective expertise, but also government expertise in ensuring that that these activities um, offer sort of a, a, a holistic package to the people we need, which then drive the improvements to the early warning system and triggers. Right? So we notice, for instance, in Bangladesh, it may take us many, many days in order to reach all the people or in a place like Nepal, which has this extremely complex terrain. We may need our early warning systems to be capacitated to allow us five or six days lead time. In other places, maybe we need less um, in order to put these processes in place. And that's exactly the type of information we want to convey back to, to our development partners or to our internal programs that are building capacity in, in national systems. And of course, that second half, the financing mechanism, was then much easier to define because we were able to say, well, these activities cost this much. Now, people would say, well, why don't you tell me when it's 100%? Tell me when it's going to 100% happen. And and it's funny because life is not 100%. Never is. There's always there's always a chance it may not happen, and there's always a chance that it may happen. And so we spent a lot of time talking about the cost of action and the cost of inaction. So cost to deliver early warning messages, letting people know what's coming is is quite little. The cost to be able to get ourselves operationally ready to support anticipatory actions is very little. And so we're able to define um the skillfulness of these of these early warning message or early warning models against the cost of acting and then of course contrast it against the cost of inaction if we don't invest a little bit now in terms of humanitarian anticipatory humanitarian aid what are the impacts should nobody evacuate and um, what are the impacts uh, in a, in the longer term so i thought i would give a give a few examples uh, of where this has happened. I mean, it's not a, uh, it's 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 not robust. But I wanted to, I wanted to sort of just give this this feeling a, a little bit of what we're of what we're doing, just to see the different contexts in in and how this is and how this is happening. And when we and when we first started um, this work, we really needed to find these sort of champion champion countries like Bangladesh, where 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 there was no conflict, where there's a functioning government, where things are working quite well. But we really wanted to focus on that ability of helping people get ahead of, of, of the increasing number number of floods. Comes to a place like Somalia, where we're missing some of those from those components, whilst being under uh, some major humanitarian needs, 
it really brought around everybody to have a discussion. And when I say that, I mean a lot of talking and a lot of planning and a, and a, and a lot of challenging discussions on on how do we actually make sure people are 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 aware of what's of what's coming their way. And I think I think this was huge, um, a huge a huge change in in mindset to let people know. Look, yes, there are a lot of needs right now in 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 Somalia, but unfortunately, there's also something coming. At the very little, we need to make sure we cover millions of people with that information so that they can make that empowered choice uh, of what to do with with what little they have now. And knowing that the, the forecast for drought was potentially not across the entire country, could we further focus on on identifying those regions that are about to be to be hit again? Um, and and I, and I won't lie, this has made a big a big this was not like as though WFP and, and, and other partners, as, as, as Julia knows, just turned around and just did this right. It was it was not the way of working it was not the usual way. So this has meant a huge amount of capacity strengthening internally that's needed that's that needed to be done. Um, and our partners like Germany and Denmark and Norway and Ireland, and Switzerland and and others um, have really come to come to our aid in, in, in making sure that making sure that happens. And so so in Somalia, this was a really a, a really interesting uh, piece that I wanted to to talk a little bit about. I know there's a lot of information online, um, but I thought it was a, a very nice example uh, coming from speaking about the, the working in conflict affected settings. Last year we also had and, and working with surf, we had a a, a flood in 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 Nepal and and interestingly, year before the floods happened outside the monsoon season. So, and it's 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 interesting as we think about why we want to invest in anticipatory actions. You know, historically, agencies like WFP and others would use early warnings in order for us to get ready to respond, right? To, for us to be operationally ready to reach people as quickly as possible. Um, and and that was under the guise that if we just did this now and mitigated those impacts as best as possible or save lives basically um next year will be okay right next year will be will be fine and people can recover but then next year wasn't okay and 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 as we see in the horn of africa the next year wasn't okay and the next year wasn't okay um and people weren't having that opportunity to to catch up and so in a, in a place like Nepal, which poses different challenges, you, as you all know, you know, being in the, in the Himalayas and having these small communities situated all across very complex terrain meant, meant traveling between villages and, and reaching people even with cell phones or, or radio is, is difficult, which means we need more, more time and early warning systems in order to reach people and make sure that they're empowered and, and understand um, what's coming their way. So these last these last two two interventions were were about combining cash and, and early warning information. We also have some examples around how working with FAO, we're looking at how can we make sure that agricultural inputs are then also supported by by cash to make sure that the agricultural inputs that are happening in maybe in a place like Somalia or others where people are are, are already um, struggling, that those agricultural inputs go to where they need. They're not eaten, they're not sold, right? They're not used for something different. And the way we do that is providing providing a cash top up, making sure we understand the needs now. And we need to make sure that we address those, but we address those in partnership with the idea of what we need to make sure that next season is, a, is, is as, as robust as possible, right? When we think of droughts, um, it's not that no rain falls, it's just not enough or it doesn't fall the right way. And so what types of activities and information in those early warnings that we that we sent out or climate services in general can help to mitigate those those changes in a changing climate, noting that people can no longer use what happened in the past or what their parents or grandparents told them, um, but to be able to use you know, indigenous knowledge and, and, and this type of work. Of course, this is all work that needs to be front loaded and happen and happen well ahead of time um, and requires you know, incredible coordination um, and new ideas in order to, to make happen, in order to start to see how we mitigate uh, losses and damages before they, before they even occur. So I thought maybe then I would 
I would give an example of of something like that in 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 Zimbabwe, where where in addition to to climate early warning information, we also supported um, uh, farmers with access to to safe water, uh, making sure that they had access to to water and finances for for making sure the crops that they are planting. Um, could could be harvested at the maximum amount of uh, of availability, right? And making sure that people were planting on the right dates. And when I say making sure, I mean I don't I don't mean as though we're we're walking around as the police, but empowering people with indigenous knowledge, with understanding the what's happening, communicating in local languages, making sure we're doing this in partnership with governments, right? This is not about this is not about WFP or others coming in as cowboys. And saying, you know, Zimbabwe wasn't able to provide this information. This was about partnering with with our development partners to ensure that the information that is available from Zimbabwe or could be available from Zimbabwe um, was was reaching the people that we needed in order to change these types of activities in order to get ahead of of that curve. At WFP, I work at HQ um, and, and and the last few examples have been, you know, for me, some of the most important parts, which is providing people with a dignified approach, a dignified, dignified help. You know, um, having people sitting on the side of a river or in front of of a dying crop or a dead crop or or etc. Um, may may offer these sort of heart wrenching photos and and generate new financing, but. But it's not the same as as being able to come to a home or a community and and say we're here to help before you need help. We're here to make sure that you're able to to make some changes in your life and make some some additional choices based on on this information that we've co-developed that we've talked about before a hazard has occurred. But that being said, <laughs> you know, people want to know what are the what are the cost savings and and it's been difficult and I think anticipatory action being a relatively new new approach and I say new approach, which is really kind of funny because we all do it every day in our lives. We make our vacations when we think the weather's going to be the best. We make contingency plans should something happen. We may get a tent for our wedding or et cetera. Um, uh, and those have costs, right? Uh, that we're willing to willing to accept. Um, but more and more as we're moving on in time, we're starting to collect the monetary benefits of, of Elaborate forecast based financing and anticipatory action just to make sure I cover cover everybody's understanding uh, of what can happen. And you'll see you'll see some of these words, some of these language, some of this, some of these texts in here are talking about many, many years into the future, looking at sort of what are the what are the changes that we would see by having an improved early warning system. And, and they're quite impressive. They're very difficult to to capture. There's something that we're working on very closely with our partners. Ocha is working very closely to capture this this work. You can imagine just from from a logical standpoint, um, having one community that gets anticipatory action um, before a flood, and then finding somehow a magical another community that looks exactly the same, but we don't give money to um, uh, before a flood, but we do it after, and then we compare them. Well, it has some moral issues there, obviously, because we should be helping people, everybody the same, um, and and that's quite difficult. Um, so, so what we've done over over time, and I think we'll see from the Nepal results this year, saying we're going to do our best to reach you know all of these people uh, before a flood has occurred, and but we're not going to stop, right? We're going to say, okay, well now we stopped, and there should be some sort of new team that comes in and does the response. We're not going to stop. This is going to be this integrated approach from. From, from preparedness, anticipatory action, and into early response. And what we can do is we can come back and start to compare those families and those households who, who had um, this assistance that happened after the flood just because of the, the time, right? I mean, and the, and the travel in a place like Nepal, and start to compare those impacts and see what people have, see what people have done. And I think, I think, you know, and you saw on that last slide that, that that's going to be really obvious. And I think even Ocha in, in our last Bangladesh um, uh, intervention saw costs that were incredible, 50% less when compared to to previous previous floods, whilst reaching the same or more people. And it's quite it's quite intuitive to imagine how that can happen, right? Roads aren't washed out, people aren't uh, evacuating, people are still able to operate um, 
you know, effectively uh, and we can reach more people and people can get out of harm's way. You know, working in WFP as the as the world's you know largest humanitarian agency, um, it, it's it sounds great on 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 talking points, um, and, I, and I'm really proud to work for them. But that's also meant like a huge heavy lift in terms of of, of trying to to build capacity in the WFP to change or integrate that that thinking. Um, and and maybe I didn't post it in here, but but our corporate strategy. Um, for WFP wide includes anticipatory actions. It includes that our immediate response account is is now applicable for anticipatory actions at scale. There's no there's no there's no limit, right? And so this vision that that WFP is is working on, where where people's food security, lives, and livelihoods are protected ahead of climate hazards, it's actually ahead of, during, and after as part of our overall um, vision. Um, was a really was a really big big lift for us and our objectives then as I had mentioned are in countries where applicable to enhance government's capacity to implement AA and in countries that may not yet be there but should be marching towards that making sure that we're institutionalizing this approach within well I say within WFP's emergency preparedness and response because that's something I have control over but ultimately we would like to see it in, implemented through the entire humanitarian program cycle and using these this evidence, this collective evidence, these collective partners in order to to continue growing. So with sport from from Germany in 2015, we started out with five countries and, and now we're at, at about 30 and, and our target is to to have 40 countries um, by the end of 2026. And here's the, the, the sort of piece of where we've reached, which which has been this, this long, hard road, but but luckily enough, We've had these really amazing colleagues. Like sometimes you think you have the greatest idea and the greatest things, but the timing's not right. And and in this case, really things have come together at the timing. We 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 came together with with the right colleagues, the right people, um, the right time, the right interest. The climate crisis is is really coming down. At the same time, these numbers are probably not as big as we need to see in terms of of what we do. But we need to start somewhere. So we started with nothing, and and this is where we've arrived. This is where WFP has arrived. And once I combine Start Network, OCHA, IFRC, uh, and FAO, we're we're up to over sixty countries. Um, Speaking of so uh, fantastic is... colleagues, uh, sorry to cut you there, Jess. No problem. Right. That was my last slide. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, sorry for cutting you and interrupting the session. I think it was quite stimulating, and we can go for quite some time. But let me open the floor for my co for our colleague Anna so that she can also share her reflections as well. Anna, I have the floor. You're on mute. Okay, apologies for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, today, um, given ICRC mandate, I really will focus, of course, on conflict affected setting. I think uh, is uh, a complementary, let's say, uh, presentation from what we heard. We have uh, already heard in the introductory remark the particular vulnerability of uh, uh, people's uh, living in conflict affected setting, uh, the complexity of working there, the lack of finance, and so on. So, I I wanted uh, again to, to start from our experience and uh, I will present mainly the, uh, the context of the near the Middle East, though the approach is similar to other contexts, so it can be easily, um, let's say, transported to other. And we really start from the understanding that more and more often we are working on uh, protracted crises. Protracted crises are uh, uh, characterized by uh, a number of acute shocks that affect uh, uh, livelihood system, uh, uh, services, essential services like healthcare, uh, water supply, and so on. But uh, when they become protracted, uh, we have a series of cumulative impacts. So to the direct impact of maybe damage to infrastructure, for example, we have brain drain, we, we have a governance system that become weaker, we have uh, um, 
uh, maybe sanction and so on. And in this context, service has gone down. And I uh, want to underline this because the same services are the one that uh, uh, the, the, the one that we need to, to support people livelihood and to face and uh, absorb also uh, climate uh, shocks. And uh, again, the governance system are the, some of the most affected, I mean, it's one of the, the most affected aspects in the during protected uh, uh, conflict, uh, particularly environmental uh, governance, but uh, uh, so many other aspects. And is where in, in, instead we will look for uh, uh, for the big changes that are needed to help us to adapt, to help us to um, respond to new challenges. We are working in very complex system. Nowadays, all the systems has, are interconnected. They uh, have reverberating effect into each other and also somehow absorb and compensate in case. And then we have of, uh, the climate and the environmental gradation layers that we are adding to our uh, reading of the situation. And we come to a compound risk on uh, interconnectedness of uh, uh, the humanitarian needs due to uh, different aspects that uh, overlap, intersect, uh, contribute to each other, reinforce to each other. And it, for us, it's really important also to focus on this reading of the situation on the coping mechanism, on the adaptation mechanism that uh, community develop to be able to answer uh, to that. This brings us to, to really uh, embrace and promote a resilience-based approach to this type of uh, situation. A resilience-based approach that uh, nevertheless starts for us by the promotion of inter international humanitarian law in conflict, the importance to protect uh, basic services and also to protect the environment as we um, we have seen how uh, long term of how, how conflict had long term impact on the environment and all the services that depend on uh, on it. Um, the strengthening of, re of resilience, of course, start uh, uh, from a full understanding of the system on how the different uh, elements influence each other, how uh, people um, uh, manage to, despite all, to absorb shock, to react, to, um, uh, to, to recover. And, and this is what we want to, uh, to reinforce, the recovering um, in front of, of, of shocks. Um, this gives uh, uh, a space for a number of uh, uh, action that, uh, uh, that touch several um, sectors in a complementary way. So the first one, for example, I, I decide to bring example from uh, Gaza to give you a concrete example when, when I mean we work at different level and we think that we really need to reinforce uh, the system and reinforce with the forward looking view. Uh, so we of course work and, and we advocate for work on uh, sustaining uh, services like uh, water supply and wastewater service. We start from repair to uh, damage management, loss reduction, capacity building. We, uh, we look into, of course, uh, we, we have uh, uh, work, for example, on wastewater and uh, stormwater management to, uh, to face a uh, flood and help also um, institution and community to, to be ready for that. Uh, we work with uh, what we consider uh, really one of the uh, essential services in some uh, context that is uh, the, the power supply has uh, from each depends many of uh, other essential services are such as health, uh, education, uh, water, but also um, business and so on who help uh, uh, community to stand uh, shocks. So we have work on repairs, on promoting renewable um, energy, on the smart grid solution able to, again, to sustain essential services during um, the shocks, which are also uh, conflict uh, related. 
We uh, healthcare is another area that we think needs uh, uh, further support, uh, particularly in light of climate change, as uh, we have seen also in the region the rising of some of, uh, uh, for example, waterborne disease or other diseases linked uh, with new uh, climate uh, condition, and so. The reinforcement of uh, the health infrastructure, the repair, the capacity building, um, and also the aspect of uh, MC, um, mental uh, and psychological support. Um, food system livelihood, another uh, important component, so working at uh, household and uh, at uh, individual level. And again, here, I bring the example on how it's important also to work with our uh, weapon contamination uh, team to make sure that the farmers that, for example, are in Gaza, but we see it also in Iraq and so on, are trying to to expand um, area of cultivable land where they, uh, they, they have also water resources and so on, have to face uh, landmines, have to face uh, difficulty to access. So this is a, a key uh, element to support the capacity of uh, people to respond again and to be ready and to have a, a certain level of resilience. Um, the same uh, promoting uh, uh, here an example on a poultry farm that are more adapted to the heat to, uh, to be able to produce uh, uh, with also less use of antibiotics. Yeah, rainwater harvest is just uh, um, our example uh, or that where we in discussion with the community in this having analyzed the system locally um, are, uh, the, are uh, designing action to answer to this uh, uh, to, to this problem increase uh, the resilience of uh, communities here again we work both at the institutional level with uh, uh, seed bank local seed bank or for example here in the picture of um, the, the, uh, the support to beehives uh, adapted to the heat. Um, and uh, my last point, uh, uh, given the time constraint, is really enables. This is possible only if we have access, access to people, access uh, on the ground, uh, talk to the community so that a locally led adaptation and response can be designed. We have heard from our colleague how it's important to define which type of early warning system, which type of uh, action is needed based on the specific continent, uh, context. Uh, sorry. We need, of course, flexible and long term uh, financing that allow us not just to respond today immediate, but to build a respond and medium and long term uh, answer. So we have to be able to adapt. We have to be able to um, to build on a uh, longer term. And of course, uh, there is no humanitarian actor or developmental actor that can do this alone. Each of us has a very specific mandate, capacity, skills, and only a strong collaboration and partnership uh, uh, will allow us uh, to do that. Uh, I will just mention it will be, of course, in ICRC, we, we, we get along with the uh, I mean, we we are the first that reinforce the um, the message that has been passed earlier on, also on the need to support this country, also on facing climate change and adaptation, as uh, the uh, they are among the most uh, uh, vulnerable, and that uh, specific tools and barrier needs to be um, to be broken. And so we are happy in, in, for future discussion to. To be again uh, to present uh, uh, some of the work done with the, the same partners that today are uh, presenting on on the climate financing. I thank you so much for the time, and um, I give you back. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for your intervention and for joining us. I know that you're on the front lines and you need to rush. That's highly thank appreciated. You. Um, I'd like to invite our colleague Julia to join us and uh, share her reflections. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Just to yes, confirm. perfect. Very good. Excellent. Um, yeah, and thank you very much uh, to Helena and uh, Jesse and Anna for their presentations. I'm sure I'll 
echo um, lots of uh, what they've said actually. Um, so good afternoon everyone. My name is Julia Wittig. I'm the anticipatory action lead at the Central Emergency Response Fund within OCHA. Um, and it's actually an honor to, to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to have that um, conversation. So um, at OCHA, our role is um, obviously to facilitate collective coordinated um, anticipatory action and to really bring our community together to better serve people and communities that are vulnerable to crisis. Um, and there we're drawing on our coordination, humanitarian financing and um, data expertise. Um, the Central Emergency Response Fund has actually released um, some $89 million uh, for anticipatory action since July 2020. And with that, we've reached um, more than 3.5 million people across uh, seven countries. So we've applied this approach in Bangladesh, uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Ethiopia, Nepal, uh, Niger, Somalia and um, South Sudan, together with um, several uh, UN agency partners, uh, including WFP, as well as uh, the UN agencies, um, NGO, Red Cross and government implementing partners. And um, similar to, to WFP, we apply this approach um, with the three main components of having uh, pre-agreed um, identified triggers um, that use forecast information, um, the second element um, with pre-agreed activities, and um, having pre-arranged financing in place. And so far we've used the um, Central Emergency Response Fund for this pre-arranged financing. Now, um, what we've learned um, is that anticipatory action delivers better outcomes for people. Um, again, this very much echoes what the previous speakers have said. Um, we have seen that um, anticipatory action really helps with um, timing and speed. In the Nepal activation that uh, Jesse also mentioned, um, it took 14 minutes so minutes um, from when the government issued the flood warning to um, us uh, giving agencies the means to act. So for for SURF to press the button on the approval of of projects, and that was on a on a Sunday, and with time differences between um, Nepal and New York. So that's really, I think, what you know what anticipatory action can do when when everything is in place. Um, in terms of impact on the ground, um, we have we have lots of examples. Um, I'll just mention um, our Bangladesh study from 2020, um, where we saw that cash transfers re received a week before the flood resulted in higher food consumption three months later compared to people who received cash a few days after the flood. So these are really these positive effects tend to dissipate for each day that transfers are delayed. Um, so even a small difference in days that you can reach people ahead of time makes a massive difference. Um, and just as a reminder in 2019, so just the year before, it took some 100 days um, after the floods for cash to reach beneficiaries. So um, we, we can see what, what impacts that may have. Um, Jesse has already spoken about the cost effectiveness, so I'll, I won't need to um, uh, reiterate that. Um, I want to highlight five challenges and then um, sort of give four areas of work um, to, to say how we tackle some of those challenges. So first of all, the Overseas Development Institute um, estimates that 50% of humanitarian needs are foreseeable and 20% are predictable. So from a financing point of view, anticipatory action is about efficiency and effectiveness, but unfortunately we don't yet have the funding or have enough funding for anticipatory action. And some of the existing funding is quite fragmented and not always coherent um, between what people call um, build money, so the money to set up anticipatory action and fuel money, so the money to actually fund anticipatory action or the, the concrete assistance. So um, there's a need to, to coordinate and finance um, anticipatory action more coherently. Second, um, we're dealing with risk and that's um, very familiar to all of you in the climate community, um, not observed needs. And so there's obviously a trade-off between early warning lead times versus the reliability of those warnings. Some events are also very difficult to forecast. So we need to manage the, the financial risk associated with forecast uncertainty. And we've identified some ways for how to do that um, in sudden onset emergencies. Uh, the SURF, for example, relies on a two-stage trigger, um, which distinguishes between a readiness and an action 
stage. So the funding is um, released considering the skill of the forecast and the needs um, by agencies as the shock gets closer. Another way um, to offset that risk is obviously by targeting um, the most vulnerable, and that's what our focus is um, as OCHA and in the humanitarian community. Um, so even if the forecast doesn't happen as predicted, we're still supporting the most vulnerable in communities with um, assistance that is useful. And then finally, you know, in for anticipatory action, we set triggers for extreme events. So, but that means that even if the forecast is off, it may just mean that it's a crisis of different intensity, but it still affects people. Third challenge is that anticipatory action relies on preparedness and readiness. Um, and Jesse mentioned this as well. The, so that means assessments um, of, of required improvements, registration of beneficiaries, advanced procurement. And this is outside the funding uh, criteria of many of the humanitarian financing instruments, including the SURF. So the difficulty here is that preparedness activities must be carried out before triggers are reached, and SURF can only fund after a trigger has been reached. So that has required us to develop some creative solutions, um, often working across different funding sources to ensure that um, the partners can actually make anticipatory action happen. And fourth, um, again, this, this is um, very familiar to all of you, um, as triggers extend to new shocks and new contexts, um, additional expertise, data and collaborations must be developed. Certain technical questions um, are becoming more pressing with climate change. So for example, whether an erratic rainfall pattern should be treated as a shock or how thresholds should be corrected to reflect more recent trends. We can't necessarily develop on um, or rely on historical data from the last 20 to 30 years. So these needs amplify the importance um, of strong partnerships with climate scientists who can provide context specific insights and technical nuances critical to define a trigger. And finally, um, again, I think the, the challenge here um, is, is related to the silver bullet um, that anticipatory action is not. We need to manage expectations. Um, anticipatory action is not going to make hazard disappear or solve conflict or halt climate change, but it is well suited for predictable hazards that turn into predictable humanitarian problems, um, which we currently estimate at 20%. And those, let's not forget that the people who are reached with it, anticipatory action for them, it does make a big difference. But only a fraction of funding right now is anticipatory. So what that means is that while we reach more people with anticipatory actions, we still see human suffering. So the crisis didn't disappear entirely. Um, and a case in point is the Horn of Africa, where um, OCHA supported anticipatory action um, for, with several agencies. Jesse also mentioned it. Um, we, we did anticipatory action, but the crisis is still huge. It's a massive crisis. Um, and the small amount of anticipatory action funding we had available was obviously not available, uh, was not um, able to, to stem the whole crisis. What we did, however, um, change is the trajectory of the crisis for the people we reached. They made it through um, better. So next time we just need to reach more. So um, let me just um, end um, by giving you uh, four ideas how to overcome uh, some of these challenges. So first is an expansion of flexible, coordinated and predictable financing. Um, Martin Griffiths, the emergency relief coordinator in February, agreed to invest more from the OCHA managed pooled funds in support of anticipatory action, but we also need more co-financing um, and we want to work more intensely with development actors um, and climate finance to invest in the anticipatory approach. I saw there was a question um, in the chat around um, development uh, financing coming in. Um, and so, you know, we have, as I, as we mentioned, there are a lot of prerequisites for anticipatory action that need to be in place in terms of the early warning systems. That's obviously out of um, out of the scope of a sort of humanitarian financing mechanisms like the SURF, um, but also in order to reach a larger uh, number of people, we need to link up with government systems, social safety net systems, um, and that obviously goes then also into the, um, that re requires um, financing, international financing instruments and um, development institutions. Um, and, and 
yeah, so so those um, those approaches will will help with with some of those um, challenges around preparedness as well. The second point um, is mainstreaming. Um, we need to integrate anticipatory action with the existing humanitarian planning tools. Um, and again, um, OCHA is going to work with national governments to help institutionalize um, anticipatory approaches. Third, so almost my last point is. Um, while there has been a lot of progress on investing in early warning, um, again, more needs to be done um, for these warnings to reach the most vulnerable and to enable them to take preventive action themselves. And here we have the um, Secretary General's early warning for all initiative, which is trying to bring together um, the value chain from disaster risk knowledge, early warning um, and to, to response. And um, OCHA is working um, very closely with that initiative. And then fourth and finally, um, we need, again, partnerships beyond the humanitarian system. So we want to promote, align and support um, the anticipatory approach with the development community, especially with the um, international financial institutions like the World Bank's Early Response Facility, um, as well as you all in the climate community. And uh, we think anticipatory action is a, is a natural fit um, to avoid uh, loss and damage um, in the context of disasters. So I'll um, I'll stop here and I look forward to the discussion. Back to the chair. Perfect. Thank you very much, Julia, for that rich intervention. Uh, speaking of uh, speaking with the, engaging with the widest partners on looking at the medium term risks, I'd like to invite our colleague Alexandra from the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research to share some commentary. Alexandra, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks once again for the kind invitation to participate in this uh, online webinar. I am delighted to be here and sincerely welcome the opportunity to bring military spending, security and defense component to our discussion today. Um, I would also like to thank the audience, of course, for attending the event. Uh, it's great to see that so many people are interested in and working with this uh, subject. So once again, my name is Alexandra Kuimova. I'm a researcher uh, with the Conventional Arms and Ammunition Program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, where I contribute to the development and implementation of research and analysis on security and development issues. The plan for my uh, short uh, intervention today is the following. I will try to provide a short introduction to the general trends in armaments, military spending, uh, focusing on the developments in the Middle East and North Africa region as a case, including the United Arab Emirates. Then I will speak about the subject of opportunity costs, uh, the results of choosing one alternative and foregoing another with regards to state spending priorities and security threats. I will also talk about uh, climate change issues, of course, and then I will introduce you to the initiative currently implemented at UNIDIR, uh, my research institute, uh, that I think will serve as a thought for thought um, for further discussion. Now, let me start with uh, some trends in armament and military expenditure. So data on arms um, imports and military spending collected by a research institute, including by my former colleagues at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, indicate that several um, regions, including the Middle East and North Africa region, have been undergoing militarization. So mil military arsenals in the Middle East and North Africa grow. States are heavily investing in procurement of weapons. So several states in the region uh, have been listed among the 15 largest arms importers in the world. And this includes Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, Kuwait and the UAE. The fact that several states in the Middle East and North Africa region continue to prioritize military activities and needs, including through arms procurement, can be illustrated by looking at military spending as a share of gross domestic product, also known as military burden, and military spending as a share of government spending. So both military burden of many states in the Middle East in North Africa and levels of military spending as a share of government spending, total government spending, remain at a high level or even at the highest level uh, compared to other regions. So issues related to military spending always raise concerns about opportunity cost. So the following questions are often being asked. Um, could reduction, for example, of military spending release resources to finance security and development needs? 
or could spending allocated for military needs um, be used to address broader security risks, including tackling environmental threats, natural disaster, climate change? Another question that uh, normally asked is, do governments spend the same amount of resources on environmental and ecological stability, human security, sustainable energy, as on their military needs and activities? So we at the UNIDIR would like to research these issues further. So one way to put this into a broader perspective is to analyze what states understand by security priorities and needs and to understand whether states overall security priorities match the spending allocated to support them. So broadly speaking, we would like to see whether allocations of public spending are aligned with government um, prioritization of security threats. This include both military threats, but also non-traditional non-military threats, such as environmental changes, including climate change, natural disaster, uh, poverty. Uh, for example, we already noticed that in some cases, tackling uh, environmental threats, uh, biodiversity, climate change, uh, deforestation are mentioned among the main security priorities of some states. So the question is, uh, if states identify environmental or climate change risks as security challenge, are they planning to spend resources on tackling these risks accordingly? So we try to identify whether uh, by bringing broader, by bringing discussion on broader security risks and threats, uh, to the table, we try to identify whether the concept of the state security should be expanded, whether we should look beyond military threats, also with regards to um, spending allocated to deal uh, with these insecurities. This approach could serve as an anticipatory action following, allowing uh, the balance uh, future financial allocations between spending on tackling military threats with other vital risks and threats to human security, including um, addressing issues related to environmental changes and climate change. So my intervention today aimed at to initiate this broader discussion at the national and multiracial level on strengthening the process of effective allocation of public resources uh, for security needs, especially uh, if these needs include tackling non-traditional vital risks and threats such as, uh, for example, climate change. I would welcome your thoughts and opinions about this issue, and I will stop now. I hope that uh, we will continue the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention and the time. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your uh, profound remarks. Um, I think by opening the door for the question and answer, something which kept on coming back is the question of the decision of what is anticipatory humanitarian action, what is anticipatory action, and what are the key political considerations potentially to advise guiding the financing flows into this area. We know, for example, as Julia mentioned, is that the SERF, the Interagency Standing Committee on, on Humanitarian, that manages humanitarian coordination, has quite narrow definitions in terms of what qualifies as humanitarian response that can be resourced through humanitarian response plans and, and falls within that broader category. But what we're looking at through anticipatory action is expanding going beyond that, investing in adaptation needs so that our societies are more resilient in the faces of shocks. Shocks that we can anticipate like 50% of the humanitarian shocks, but also shocks that are likely to come and we have a range of understanding what will be the impact of that. And we have huge maximum returns Returns for investments in there. As uh, Jesse mentioned, it's a $34 return to each dollar invested in this area. A response within 14 minutes, like the situation of Nepal, shows that so many lives can be saved and lots of uh, support and measures can be put in place in order to mitigate the worst impacts, especially if you're, if you're likely to have a protracted humanitarian crisis and how long does that displacement go and how does how do natural disasters, man-made crises affect and reverse the gains that we have achieved in development, the development uh, uh, work over the last years. So the big question for us is in terms of how can we mobilize the financing required? And I really appreciate Helena's opening remarks, which she, I think she mentioned financing like seven times in her remarks trying to highlight. So this works, this is needed, this is desperately needed. This falls at the core of the humanitarian response agenda. It falls at the core of the development agenda. It is a core uh, climate change and climate response issue. But also, as Alexander mentioned, this is a security issue. The well-being of our societies, our, our future security as, as a planet 
goes beyond borders, looking at crisis, looking at uh, trends and financing and funding armaments, uh, the geopolitics of how this is going and what questions this can raise in relation to addressing the key issue that we need to anticipate. And at the end of the day, this falls onto the humanitarian community in terms of how it goes. So on that note, maybe I can open the floor for a couple of questions. I, I noted that there are some questions in terms of uh, financing, but there are also two questions on the uh, sector specific, like on agriculture sector and how do we work with local governments, like in the case of Somalia, Sudan, I believe, and Nigeria, but also in the wider spectrum of society. So perhaps I can open the floor for reflections along this, uh, starting perhaps with Helena and then moving with the same order. Helena, any thoughts around these two questions? Okay, maybe the connection I see Helena just dropped. Maybe you can move to Jesse. Yep, no problems. Um, with respect to the, if I remember the questions right, with the government part, I mean, I think, I think, you know, that we really don't have a choice. We, the national authorities for delivering early warning systems are the governments, and we need to make sure that they are empowered to to deliver the types of warnings that allow humanitarians and 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 own government response act in the time. Uh, that they need, right? And and so that needs to be that needs to happen from from the get go. In 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 other places where maybe those those instruments aren't yet as strong, the humanitarian and development partners can lean in and start to bridge that gap. And I think that's fine, right? To start to show people how we can transition or build these types of capacity even in places of protracted crisis. So I think this is this is imperative and 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 much different than from a response when when everybody can see the impacts and we can define exactly what we need. In this case, we all need to be there there together. The agricultural inputs are are are, are challenging. Uh, they're long seasons. They often overlap previous uh, seasons from prior, you know, from prior losses, etc. They require the types of conversations um, with communities and and farmers long long before uh, these hazards have occurred. And making sure that we're designing interventions, the community-based interventions, um, um, together. Right. This has to be part of part of something that we. That we do together, and I think this is why why it's important that the organizations like FAO, WFP, etc., come together uh, at the table and understand how we can collectively solve these problems, but always with with that people centered approach. It's not it's not a one size fits all, and 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 that's fine, right? This is the this is the the core part of our our joint work in making sure people are at the center of these pieces, and nothing changes with respect to to how we anticipate those hazards. Over. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Julia? Thanks. I mean, um, I can speak to uh, some of the government pieces, perhaps. Um, so far in the anticipatory action frameworks that we've uh, supported um, and facilitated as OCHA together with our partners, um, we work um, as closely as possible with the governments. I mean, as Jesse said, we, you know, we want to um, ensure that those approaches are taken up at the country level. Um, that they remain beyond, um, you know, that, that that will be an approach that can be taken up um, by the government and for other partners to come in. And that um, I think someone um, also mentioned uh, the sorts of, you know, what what early warning systems um, are are usable, actionable, and believable, and um, that are trusted by um, uh, communities in country. Um, and so that. We have worked in several countries, so government is always, and we always have government representatives on the anticipatory action pilots, um, notably the um, hydromet services, um, but also, you know, all the line ministries that are relevant uh, for the various sectors. Um, we're trying to use national um, forecast systems as much as possible um, or help improve them. We've done that um, in, in Bangladesh. Uh, we're doing that in Niger, um, where actually in Niger, I, and Jesse can comment on that better than I can, but I, I think, um, you know, there's a, a WFP uh, IRI project and um, so monitoring for the anticipatory action framework was done by Columbia University's um, 
uh, International Institute for Research in Climate and Society and is now being handed over to uh, the um, National Hydromet Service. So that's an example of where we're moving towards, you know, from building capacity and using international systems to actually transferring that um, and transferring the monitoring responsibility um, to the national government. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Julia. Alexandra? Uh, not much to uh, add, to be honest, from my side. However, I do think that uh, we need to think about looking at the data that we had previously, uh, data on financing, data on um, monitoring such actions, and then use the lessons from the past uh, to create the future. So that's probably one of my um, comments because what we are trying to do now has been done already for some time. So I think we need to rethink the strategy behind or maybe to add some components uh, to the discussion that's already going on. And from my opinion, one of the things that probably are missing is creating synergies between different stakeholders, between different um, actors. So yeah, that's probably um, my take on this. Perfect. Thank you, Alexandra. I see Elena is back online. So Elena, if you'd like to share some reflections on the two questions or two clusters of questions raised, please jump in. Thanks so much, Red, and, and apologies, my uh, laptop died uh, the minute you asked me a question, uh, of course. Um, not much to add, I think, from my side to the questions, uh, but I did wanted to mention that as the COP28 presidency, we are organizing a series of events in the margins of um, humanitarian related uh, events and fora. Um, so that's an opportunity to engage with us. And I also wanted to note that we are, of course, very supportive of um, the UN's initiative uh, on early warning systems for all. Uh, that's another one I think that fits very clearly also into this, uh, this specific bucket. And we're looking specifically at, uh, of course, how we, we can support the rollout of this, uh, this initiative to cover um, everyone by, uh, by early warning systems. Thank you, Elena. Uh, perhaps as a concluding words, I'd like to uh, reflect again on the four points that was shared by Anna and shared by Julie. Actually, I think they're the same four points in terms of what are the key next steps. And the key common message that we tend to always reflect on is the issue of having systems in place that help us respond to an increasingly demanding basket and basket load case in relation to anticipatory action, the broader uh, phase of actions, but also in terms of the capabilities required mobilizing governments, civil society, other partners to engage in that and working closely with local communities. There is a lot of attention going to traditional knowledge in terms of how do we deal with the existing systems that have been in place with the, dealing with natural crises, dealing with res immediate response and engaging with the existing capacities on the ground. And the question of what additional capacities do we need to have to deal with tomorrow's crisis? Was it in relation to the direct crisis that we know about, but also the other areas that are broadly, uh, broadly falling within the security realm of our well-being, of the well-being of our societies? So I, I highly appreciate the work that World Food Program, OCHA, ICRC. Uh, even IDR and all other partners working across the humanitarian development and also political spectrum on this. I think we will make uh, some significant advances on the road to COP28 and at COP28 in terms of raising awareness of different partners of how working together in a systems approach will help us address some of those issues. And we look forward to your continued engagement in our session of webinars the 28th for 28th next week, same time. Uh, different link, I think Surya was to at that link, uh, we'll be discussing on the issue of uh, climate action and human values. So that will be an interesting session. I'd like to thank our speakers and panelists. I'm looking forward to connecting with you again next week. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.